Welcome to the session on stem cell bioethics. Uh, my name is Tom Tubon. I'm with Madison Area Technical College. And part of the reason that brings me here um, is a, um, a grant award from the National Science Foundation to develop a program, a technical program in stem cell science uh, that was spearheaded by these two fabulous folks right here, uh, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Seidman, Dr. Jeanette Bowery. Um, and we, with that program, um, if you've heard anything about that or if you've not, then uh, please give me just a couple minutes to introduce that program. It is a um, program in stem, human stem cell um, science and regenerative medicine at Madison Area Technical College. Uh, we uh, were awarded a grant in 2011 to develop this program uh, with support from the National Science Foundation. And under the support, uh, we've been able to bring programming in this very highly um, technical field down to the community uh, college level uh, to help develop the workforce uh, in stem cells and regenerative medicine. And so in, in, in uh, um, developing that program, what we're hoping to do is provide resources to other folks across the United States in order to help establish programming uh, in stem cells, uh, human stem cells, um, for the content in lecture or laboratory. So if there's any, any uh, things that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, the focus for what we're going to be talking about today is stem cells um, and bioethics, because as uh, the field is rapidly evolving, the impact of stem cells has become, uh, has shifted. And it's shifted in such a way that we now need to emphasize different things uh, in order to address the emerging technologies. And so this is what we're gonna we're gonna focus in on on today. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background uh, with stem cells, and I think that most of you in the room are familiar with uh, with components of stem cell science. Um, but in terms of, of human stem cells, there are really two characteristics that help us to define what these cells are. The first is that they are um, human cells, which are capable of replication and self renewal, which means that in the dish we can actually propagate them for presumably indefinite passages. Uh, and then the other characteristic is that they are unspecialized. And in that state, we're able to push them into directions uh, that we would like to, to develop tissues such as neurons, muscle tissue, epithelial or skin tissues. Um, and this has to do with a component of cell po uh, potency. Uh, we're going to get to that, and, and as a matter of fact, as we move forward, um, the idea of personalized medicine actually is what's creating this whole um, issue with the uh, emerging technologies and, and bioethics, and so we're definitely going to address that. Okay, so when when human stem cells were first identified um, by the Thompson by the Thompson's lab in 1998, um, these were derived from human embryonic uh, tissues. And the origin of these come from a fertilized egg, the union of a sperm and egg, uh, to form the fertilized egg. And about day 4.5, uh, you get a structure called a blastocyst. And the cells around the outside of the blastocyst are called the trophoblasts. Those trophoblasts occurring in utero gestation become the placental tissue or extra embryonic tissue. And the stem cells actually are derived from the inner cell mass. And so if you see the cavity in this blastocyst, cells are removed from the inner cell mass, those are propagated, and then they are cultured outside of the body, and those are what we uh, term stem cell lines. So human embryonic stem cells, they're pluripotent, they are originally derived from in vitro fertilized embryos, um, and currently there are over 279 eligible human embryonic stem cell lines that are available through the NIH registry. Um, Fifteen of these lines we have access to through our partners in Wisconsin, uh, which is Weissel. And for all intent and purposes, they're still considered the gold standard because in early embryonic or early development, what their role is is to become other tissues of the body. And so essentially, completely naive, unprogrammed cells. So going back to 1998, when these were first identified by the Thompson lab, that raised a bunch of ethical questions. Um, that we have all become familiar with. And just to overview some of these questions, we're talking about questions like, um, you know, does life begin at uh, the point of fertilization or in the womb or at birth? Is a human embryo equivalent to a human child? Does a human embryo have rights? What would, what would the destruction of an embryo be justified if it really if it helped us to, to identify a cure for a particular disease or disorder? Um, 
And in, in, an interesting um, correlate here is that these embryonic stem cells, we can grow these in culture. And so having the ability to grow them indefinitely in culture raises a question in theory that if these cells can technically, or in theory, still become an entire human being, you know, is the embryo really destroyed? And again, we're going back to 1998, where a lot of these questions surround the, 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 the discovery of human stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. Um, will stem cells lead to the commodification of human tissues, organs, and perhaps organismal or therapeutic cloning? And we're gonna revisit this at the very end. And one of my most uh, uh, my favorite questions that comes out is will stem cells lead to the hubristic quest for regenerative immortality or the proverbial fountain of youth? And so these are some of the questions that were raised back in 1998. And as a society, we've struggled with trying to find answers to these questions. And there's no real clear cut way to address these types of things. Um, on top of this, on top of these types of questions, uh, we can fold in our religious values. And when we talk about society and how we view um, stem cells uh, from a religious uh, standpoint, um, we're really looking at the moral acceptability of human embryonic stem cells based on the status which we assign to the early developmental process or uh, the blastocyst. What is the blastocyst? Is it, is it actually, can we assign anything to that? What is the status of that? So just reviewing some of the, the major uh, religions and how religions view um, embryonic stem cells, we can look at Judaism. And as a starting point, the embryo has no moral status until about 40 days post implantation. And actually, it, it's, a, it's considered a fairly good thing to use um, embryos or cells derived from the embryo if they've never been implanted in the womb uh, for research in the laboratory. Um, so that's an interesting spin on, on, on ideology there as well. And full human status is only gained after the fetus emerges from the body, so at birth. If we look at Islam, what we're talking about is the moral status of the fetus, which begins with insolvent. And this is a term timed out at about uh, the fourth month of pregnancy, or about 120 days post implantation. Hinduism, life begins at conception, um, but destruction of the embryos, it's really interesting when you think about these dogmas because the destruction of the embryo can be justified if it's an act done for the greater good. And this ideology is somewhat shared with Buddhism, which is uh, overlapping with the idea of recycling of life in line with reincarnation. Um, and then there's a big one, which is Christianity. And uh, one of the uh, components here is that life begins at conception and the developing embryo has a potential to become a person. And so this raises very, very important issues with the idea of personhood. Um, and establishing you know, what, what exactly is the status of the embryo. And so again, my job here isn't to point out any type of solution or resolution to these issues, it's just to make sure that we're all aware of these kinds of things. And again, this was also back in 1998. So when we look at human embryonic stem cells, and we try to put this together in a context, and I've taught this before in, in the classes I teach at the college, um, and it's very difficult to bring this forward to the students, to have them critically think about the embryo or think about what stem cells are. Um, and so what I've done is actually taken advantage of um, a format that, um, that's been out there called the stem cell or the ethical matrix, and I've adapted it to stem cells. And in this particular matrix, uh, we have students identify who the stakeholders are uh, and the ethical principles to consider when we talk about stem cells. Now, in traditional sense of the word of bringing stem cells in the classroom to talk about ethics, some of you guys may have done this and some may have you know, considered doing this, but we usually would divide up the group into two and have one play one side and the other play the other side for stem cells. Using a matrix, we actually get them thinking a little bit more critically about each component that affects society and how this goes, uh, comes together um, uh, to, to to bridge all these different principles. And so the principles include well-being, autonomy, and justice. Well-being being the safety and welfare and the health of the individual, the autonomy and justice, autonomy being the individual's right and freedom to choose, and justice, to what extent is the situation just or fair for an individual or group. 
And this I have attached also to the handout that I've made available in this type of an ethical matrix. And so it's a really nice exercise to bring it in the classroom, break students up in the groups, and then have them think about what's going on here. Now again, as I've been pointing out in this first part, this rolls back into this idea of um, what was discovered back in 1998. And since then, technology has changed, and they've changed quite rapidly. And with the um, uh, discovery of new sources for stem cells, we bring in new issues uh, in stem cell bioethics. And these are a little bit of the, it's an overview, very brief overview of the history here. Um, human embryonic stem cells from 1998, isolated from human blastocysts. And then we fast forward to 2007, uh, where we can now isolate stem cells or create stem cells by genetically reprogramming adult skin cells or somatic cells. And so we can now make cells using techniques in biotechnology from these somatic cells. And this has revolutionized uh, much of what we're doing nowadays. Um, but very recently, if you guys are familiar with the idea of uh, cloning uh, Dolly, um, we can take advantage of that technology and researchers have in Oregon, and what they have done is they've been, been able to create a new cell stem cell model uh, called nuclear transfer embryonic stem cells. And that's a way of producing stem cells from adults, such as me and such as you, who didn't have the opportunity and obviously don't have access to these, what we consider the gold standard for stem cells. And then of course there are these new STAP stem cells, uh, stress triggered, um, acquired pluripotency stem cells that was recently retracted in May. So the field has grown quite rapidly in the last 12 years or so. And this, if you're familiar with the stat stem cell controversy, um, that's really important, but we're not going to get into it because of a lack of time. But very recent identification of a new, potentially new model of stem cells that's easy to make, but uh, other researchers that have been having difficulty reproducing. So. The stem cell controversy, the question is, is it over or is it just beginning? Because back in 1998, we had these types of stem cells isolated from the embryo, um, and they all lead to pluripotent stem cells. Now we have iPS cells and other adult stem cell models, and these models help us to uh, do the same types of things that we were using human embryonic stem cells for, for research and development, and also for clinical application. And so I, I just want to review the different types of stem cells very briefly. So human, human embryonic stem cells, or HESCs, I kind of went over that in, in, in short order. Um, and then there's tissue-specific tissue or somatic adult stem cells and iPS cells, and then these nuclear transfer embryonic stem cells. So the adult stem cells, adult stem cells exist in all of the tissues of our body. Uh, we're finding them uh, in very small amounts in, um, in organs and fat tissue and various tissues. And what they are are cells that um, have the ability to become those types of tissues or cells in response to smaller injury or insult. So they have limited growth. Um, and they're considered multipotent and they can become some but not all of those tissues in the body. Uh, the adult stem cells are the models that we've been familiarizing ourselves with since um, the 1960s with blood trans, trans, uh, blood-borne diseases treating things like multiple myelomas and um, leukemias through bone marrow transplants. The inducible or induced pluripotent stem cells uh, from 2007, these show the most um, interesting and possibly relevant, direct relevant clinical application here. And the idea is you can take these cells from a patient, and I'll give you a hypothetical example. Uh, if I had um, Parkinson's disease, I can take my skin cells uh, from my arm, uh, punch that skin cell out, disassociate and plate those out onto a dish, use um, techniques to put in some of the genes to genetically reprogram those cells back to the unprogrammed state. At the unprogrammed state, you have two options. The first option is to differentiate these cells into different cell types and then go into the disease, uh, uh, disease screening for drugs so you can find out the best drugs that will, will, will have the biggest impact on those cells, on my cells. Or I can take the other arm, which is to repair these cells, use genetic tools to repair these cells uh, by genomic editing, and then create healthy cells and transplant that back into the individual at the site where they're needed. Yeah. So the repair is through foreign. The repair, if we were, so many researchers are working on the arm for the repairing of these, um, and it's technologies which 
um, we can lump together in, in, in tissue engineering or genomic engineering, genomic editing. And it's a way of actually um, manipulating the cells, stem cells, and then modifying a single base or deletions or however you want to do it. It does not. No, it doesn't. It does not. Okay, and then the last is a nuclear transfer human embryonic stem cells, and these are what we're talking about when we refer to organismal cloning or therapeutic cloning. Um, really simple technology here, um, and that is that you take an egg, you take a skin cell from an adult, and then you put the nuclei of the adult cell into the egg, and it tricks the egg into thinking that it's fertilizing. Grow that up for a couple of passages, and now you have, you can take, extract those stem cells out at about day four to five, and now you have your stem cell line from an adult. So it's a personalized model for stem cells. So you can see these stem cell models actually um, come together to demonstrate the point that now we're dealing with a completely different set of ethical questions. Our sources are different, our um, issues that we're dealing with are different, and in fact when we look at the ethical matrix we now have human stem cells that are derived from living donors which introduce quite a big, um, big issue. And then in terms of society, how are we going to manage that data you know, that, that we may end up getting from these cells, um, especially uh, with, with the new generation of technology that's coming out. So the shifting theme in stem cell ethics really isn't the idea of you know, whether we should use these cells um, or, or how we should use or <coughs> how. <laughs> It's, we're, we need to focus in on, on instead of whether, not, not whether we should use these cells, but how we should use these cells. And, and actually, when we talk about the therapeutics, who's going to get these kinds of therapeutics? And so what are the additional emerging issues? Um, there are four that I want to present here. The first are social issues, oversight, accessibility of stem cell-based therapies. The second is this idea of stem cell tourism. And this is commonly referred to, we'll show a short, short little clip here. And the, the third is data management and participant consent. And the fourth is these nuclear transfer human embryonic stem cells, because we're going back to this idea of working with the embryo and then getting into this idea of organismal cloning. So in terms of social issues, oversight and accessibility for stem cells, uh, the global community has come together. Uh, there's an International Society for Stem Cell Research that some of you may be familiar with. But in terms of the ethical and the ethics committee, uh, this has only been formed very recently. About two months ago, a paper was published with a consortium for an international stem cell initiative working party. And they're trying to address these next generation issues. Com uh, company, uh, countries throughout the world, like the UK, Australia, Brazil, and China, all have regulations in play within their country, but in terms of global organization, it still, it still needs to be addressed. Within the confines of the United States, we have the FDA. Uh, FDA is regulating um, many of these um, human stem cell uh, tissues and cell products through the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, 21 CFR 1271, and also oversight by the National Institutes of Health. A number of legislative bills have been passed, such as HR 2520, uh, which helps us to establish uh, blood banks and so on. Of course, Obama's um, executive order in 2009, uh, which helped to reverse uh, barriers uh, to stem cell research. And then in the United States, we have independent citizens oversight committees and IRBs in our own institutions. But currently, there really is no global un unanimity on stem cell research and policies. And so we need to kind of focus in on these kinds of things to bring the world together. In terms of social issues, uh, one of the things that is a real um, a clear and emerging pattern is that there are a number of people who can be served by stem cell technologies. So 128.4 million people, and if we break this down into various conditions, um, the biggest one being cardiovascular or heart disease type conditions, we're talking about 58 million all the way down to, you know, we're talking about things like burns and spinal cords and birth defects. So a number of people within the United States um, stand to benefit from stem cell science. And so we have to ask the question of how do we determine who will receive these stem cell um, therapies instead of asking the question, should we actually use them? There are a couple of key considerations as well um, in terms of these diseases or the disease state. What disease should we work on first? We have to consider the number of people with the disease, the groups that suffer from the disease, and the severity of the disease as well. 
Um, how many people are dying from the disease? Uh, average age at death? And what are the currently available therapeutics out there to address some of these things? So again, I'm not gonna ask you these questions. These are things that we need to just address as a society as we start going into this new generation of stem cells. Now there's a, a short video that I wanna show here, um, just a couple of minutes with, uh, to address this idea of stem cell tourism. Because as we know, the United States, within the United States, working with stem cells and stem cell therapeutics are slow to happen. And that's because there's a lot of oversight in terms of what can be applied medically. So what we're seeing is more and more companies op opening up overseas that are offering stem cell therapeutics. And so this is just a, a little in into um, the world of, of uh, Since I am involved in trying to bring stem cell therapies to the clinic, I've become very concerned about um, stem cell tourism. And stem cell tourism is a uh, exploitation of the promise of stem cells. People are going overseas to get treatments that promise cures using stem cells. The reason why stem cell therapies are offered outside the United States is because the United States has very, very rigorous uh, oversight over the development of any kind of drug or treatment of this kind. The people who want to use the cells in treatment have to spend years testing those cells in culture dishes, making sure that they're not dangerous, making sure that they don't carry any viruses or that they will cause any damage at all. In the United States, you cannot just decide that you think something might work. So the idea of stem cell tourism is... Regulated. All of these overseas stem cell clinics um, offer patient... I'm going to cut this short because of time, yeah. but you can definitely take a closer look at this. This is a great video. Um, Dr. Loring is um, one of the directors for the Scripps Institute Center for Regenerative Medicine. And um, very interesting uh, avenue to follow in terms of what people are trying to do for stem cell therapeutics. And uh, I'll tell you that if you try to do an internet search for available therapeutics out there, one of the first sites that you're going to hit is down in Panama. So overseas, um, you know, just be aware of these types of things uh, with stem cell therapies. Okay. So well, the third point would be data management and participant consent. Okay, this is an emerging issue, and it's an issue which is really a result of our increase in our technology and our ability to sequence genomes and to have these high throughput um, resources. So with these human uh, induced pluripotent stem cells for reprogramming, we have the ability to generate personalized cells, stem cells, um, cell banking is also a big issue in establishing these repositories. And so when we talk about things like collecting cord blood during birth or um, even collecting blood cells from, from different populations in, in the southwest or in the, the um, you know, San Diego area where we're looking at collecting um, blood and samples from individuals, those eventually will find themselves uh, deposited into repositories. And those become potential sources for creation of stem cell lines and also subject to things like next generation sequencing. And for those of you who may be familiar with next gen sequencing, it's one of those powerful tools that we can now sequence human genomes in less than two weeks. In about 10 days or so, we can get an entire human genome sequence. And so we're talking about big pools of data. Uh, not only data that is, is, is um, you know, it's unlimited, it's an unlimited pool of data. And so when we first sequence a genome, we were talking about sequencing one genome in 11 years at a cost of many billions of dollars. And now it's, you can do this in a matter of 11 days, 11 to 14 days. And so the next generation sequencing, um, all these different things like the cell banking and repositories, they've created an environment where we really have to be concerned about data management and how we're actually um, working with information that is uh, potentially gonna reveal information about uh, the patient or the donor for these cells. So 
if we can imagine how this may impact issues like cybersecurity and our IT folks, it brings together areas like biotechnology or the, the, cell, the stem cell and regenerative medicine space with our colleagues in computer science to try to figure out the best way to secure these types of information repositories. The stakeholders in the next generation of stem cells include research consortia, all these big groups that have lots to gain from this. Uh, whether it is in terms of pushing the science forward, developing new technologies, or so on and so forth. Those who house the biorepositories need to be aware that their information, you know, potentially has um, huge impacts on the way that society will, uh, will work with this information. And of course, our Washington, D.C. and local and government policymakers and the agencies that fund uh, research and um, um, initiatives in the stem cell space. So the other question, one of the other questions really is, what are the thresholds for sharing and publishing data associated with these human pluripotent stem cells and research? What can we, what, what can, can we reasonably share without violating you know, any one of these patient or donor or stakeholders' rights in terms of the data and the data that's out there? So there are a couple of really important key considerations presented here. The first is that genomic analysis and next generation sequencing, these technologies are really enabling our ability to um, produce these large pools of data. Um, and we need to be able to, to manage that very efficiently and uh, with maintaining the integrity of that data and the privacy of the individuals. Um, the, the genomics data that can be isolated from these cells, whether they're raw sequences or what's called single nucleotide polymorphism, um, they include information that can be used to re-identify uh, living donors, which is a really big issue. So the estimate is that 25 of these single nucleotide polymorphisms, if you can put those through some type of computing algorithm, 25 of those SMPs are enough to identify someone positively based on their DNA. So what are those SMPs? If you're familiar with companies like 23andMe, those SMPs are how they characterize the kind of things which you may be predisposed to or you know, your allergies and things like that. There are the differences between you and me. So the genomic data, uh, very robust data, but we're now talking about the ability to re-identify living donors based on that. And so what about the trackability between what's used in research environment um, to the individual who was the, 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 the original donor. So the re-identification. Re-identification is the ability to protect, of the protected data to be tracked back to the participant. And so we need to be aware of, of these type, types of issues. This can happen directly, indirectly, deliberately, unintentionally, um, but it can happen. And with that type of computing power that's out there, and as we move forward with this idea of working with stem cells, um, again, really important issue to, to consider. Do you understand the importance of um, tracking the recipient? What, what is the need for tracking the What does that do? Well, so if the recipient takes these cells in and for whatever reason they develop a condition that is very unique and it's a product of those cells, or there's someone who's doing research on those cells that identifies um, sequences in the DNA through next-gen sequencing that may have an impact on the actual original donor. What if there was a, a discovery in the sequencing of that gene which could increase that donor's uh, lifespan or um, something else which, which uh, you know, quality of life issues? You know, would you want to know about this and can you know about that? Right now, the answer is you cannot trace that back unless the person who's doing those kinds of studies is, is a clinically certified, certified as a clinician. Um, another key concern, really, when we're talking about the ability to identify individuals um, is the potential for personal and health information that can be linked to individual groups or sp individuals or specific groups and so on and so forth. And so we need to be able to um, kind of put that into perspective as well. And then the last is really the breach of participant donor consent and trust. What, what are we concerned about here when we're talking about 
um, these huge pools of data and um, remain, keeping this uh, information intact as we move forward. Um, so the nuclear transfer, human embryonic stem cells, or these NTS ESCs, when we're talking about uh, um, the impact on therapeutic and human cloning, I explained a little bit about how they're sourced out, the origins of those. Um, and this is really relatively new information that has just um, hit the uh, research and development scene. And just to demonstrate how quickly the field is moving, these nuclear transfer, or the newest generation of stem cells, have already been put into play. And what uh, researchers have been able to do, about two months ago, they published a paper where they show that they're able to create these cell models for individuals that have type 1 diabetes. And now they have patient-specific cell models using the nuclear transfer human embryonic stem cells. The potential exists here to actually push the envelope out a little bit further. Remember I said 4.5. Day 4.5 is when you harvest those, um, those cells. But you can actually push this out. In the United States, it's about day 12, where they say you can't um, continue on growing those embryos in the lab. And in the UK, it's day 14. And so the potential exists to continue on. But again, that is uh, work that's not uh, permissible within the United States. And so as I wrap this up, um, these are kind of issues that I wanted to bring to the table, and I don't mean to leave open ends out there, but the whole idea is to consider some of these elements when we talk about human stem cells and the next generation of issues which we as a society will face. There are so many things that technology has brought um, and made available to us that enable the advancements um, that we're enjoying nowadays, but we also need to consider this very carefully because as we do move forward, we need to bring together partners in IT for cybersecurity. We need to bring in our computing partners to help us manage next generation sequence data um, to effectively police or over, to provide oversight um, so that this application of stem cells in regenerative medicine um, keeps its integrity as we move forward. So, um, yeah? When nucleus is replaced, does that mean Okay, so say I wanted to create stem cells from you, um, we would take an egg, take that egg out and take one of your cells, and then actually take the DNA from your cells and, and that nucleus and put it into the egg. So it's engineered from one person, um, although there, I remember hearing a report about multiple people contributing, but this I think it was overseas, it was in the UK. So when that adopts my DNA, it, does. it doesn't change. It doesn't. Have there been any recorded cyber attacks that they're tracking? Not that I'm aware of at this point. Not not for the not for genomic data. So there's a um, an effort that's out there right now called a 10,000 person genome. And it's a consortium where they're sequencing all these different genomes, and that's going to be a huge repository of data. So, uh, you know, that would be an interesting pilot to see whether or not you know, are, is that data secure and how are we working to, to so police that. Didn't National Geographic do a similar large repository of, uh, on a genome project? Yeah. And that was the same thing that was happening. Do they control security of that data? Or you know, I'm not familiar. I, I know yeah. 23andMe has been putting out a lot of publicity about how they are controlling it because they're trying to make sure Necessarily need to uh, because the cells that are derived from those sources are called stromal cells, and the stromal cells have limited potency, per potency. Um, so those we can use in a limited capacity. For example, if we took cells from your from from a blood-based um, tissue, uh, we can isolate those and generate uh, cells from the immune system from those. So it's not really necessary to actually um, do a nuclear replacement for those. The they don't have one way to Right. 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 Right.
There is not because in, in what 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 individuals who have leukemia or multiple myeloma often do or seek as part of their treatment is bone marrow transplants, and so um, when we we see this happen in the clinic, what it involves is uh, an ex vivo or an amplification of, of of the stromal cells outside of the body and transplantation back into the individual. And so, can we? I guess maybe your question is, can we take cells from that individual to transplant right back in? I think if you keep on track with what's happening out there, that's what we project we would be able to do. If we if we um, buy into what Alan Trenson is saying, who was the director for the CIRM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, he predicts that about 15 to 20 years down the road, those kinds of therapeutics are gonna be widespread or more readily available anyhow. Um, but the idea is just that. And it not only works for, for things like leukemia, but for other situations like diabetes, uh, potentially for things like Parkinson's and other neurological diseases as well. As long as we can identify the genetic basis for some of these, um, it gives us a handle on addressing um, how to um, to manipulate the genomes in order to correct, rectify the situations. So. Great. I have another question. Sure. On your early embryos that are day four and a half, when you're removing the stem cells, you're destroying the well, um, in 2000, in 1988, 1998, when this was first done, the embryo was destroyed. Now, techniques have refined to the point that in 2010, you can actually remove cells from the inner cell mass without destroying the embryo. Okay, so you're using micromanipulation yes. to remove Well, I think that the controversy has changed. Um, with that, with the technology as it is now, I mean, you can still take that out, but now you're having a separate cell line as well as an intact embryo. And so that creates a, a different kind of ethical dilemma of whether or not now can you use this embryo, what do you do with the cell line? Is the cell line a reflection of the embryo? And how can, you know, are they clones of each other, essentially? But what if you want to just, I guess, those kinds of things are already being done, where they're actually doing this pre-implantation genetic screening. And so, you know, this gets into another big old ethical sphere of eugenics and designer babies and things like that early on. And so, um, it's a very interesting question, but it, it does raise a lot of, of, of new issues as we move forward. That's a really tough question because the science which has led to that discovery that you can actually remove the cells from the inner cell mass and remain intact for the embryo, um, those types of studies to the best of my knowledge have not been carried out beyond day 12. Uh, so there's no implantation of those embryos where cell lines have been created. They just show that the cell, the embryo does continue to develop during early normal uh, developmental um, phases. Uh, 
uh, but they stop the cycle at about day 12 because of regulations against open and smoke. So there's no clear uh, uh, evidence that there's anything defective early on uh, with removal of cells from the inner cell mass in isolation from the HFCs for that technique. It, it, you know, it, it's, it, there's always possibilities, sure. But I, I don't think that, at least uh, in any time soon, we're going to see any type of those, those questions answered, uh, at least not in the human system. Okay, I think it's 9 o'clock, and with, the, um, with respect to the folks who are going to be coming in here afterwards, I think, you know, I'm, I, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I have a couple of other pieces of information up here if anyone wants some um, about the certificate program that we have for stem cells. Um, and yes, please feel free to contact me with any other questions or uh, if you're interested in some other resources related to stem cell uh, education or uh, materials that you may consider using in your classrooms. Thank you. Thank you.